Welcome back to Civil Wars. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on War's Inefficiency Puzzle. I cover it in Chapter 2 of The Rationality of War. So if you remember back to last lecture, we saw in an algebraic model how the costs of war ensure the existence of mutually preferable settlements to war. What I want to do in this lecture is take that algebra and turn it into a geometric representation of the problem, which we will then interpret. So let's start off with the very basics of the model of war. So remember that we had two actors, the rebel group R and the government G. And we are imagining here, for the sake of this visual representation, that they are bargaining over how large the rebel group's autonomous region should be. Now you can apply the same sort of logic to any other deal or issue that they're bargaining over, but for the sake of interpretation, it's easiest to think of this as just a strip of territory. So we can think of the rebel's base as being on the left side of that line, and the government's base as being on the right side of the line. The value of the bargaining good remains as worth one. So we can not only think of this as a line, but we can think of it as a number line, with R's base representing zero on that line, and G's base representing one on that line. And remember, they're trying to bargain over where to draw the border between these two bases. Should we draw it closer to zero? Should we draw it closer to one? Where are we going to draw it? Well, what's going to depend, or where we draw it, depends on the outside options that the actors have, namely, what do they get from war? Instead of bargaining, they could go to war. Remember that PR represented the probability that R wins, but it also is R's expected share from fighting. Remember, if the rebel group wins, then they control the entire good, so they capture everything that they're after. And so if everything is standardized to being worth one, and they win the war with probability PR, then when you multiply PR times one, that's the expected share of fighting, and so PR times one is simply PR. So PR not only represents the probability R wins, but also represents R's expected share from fighting. Similarly, G's expected share from fighting is everything that R doesn't expect to win from fighting, and since the good is worth one in total, that means G's expected share from fighting is one minus PR. So we can plot PR on this number line. Remember, PR is just a probability. It's some number between 0 and 1. So here I've drawn it at about, what is that, 0.55 or 0.6, but this is general. It could be anywhere on the line. Don't think that because I put it exactly there, it has to be there. It could vary anywhere between 0 and 1. But remember, it's just a number, so we can do that, and we can actually see what is everything to the left of PR and what everything to the right of PR is. So everything to the left of PR is R's expected share, because the length from 0 to PR is equal to PR, which is, remember, R's expected share if it were to fight a war. Now, the government's expected share is 1 minus PR, and in fact, if you look at the distance between PR and 1, that distance is 1 minus PR. You take the end point and you subtract the beginning point. 1 minus PR. That is G's expected share. So we're already seeing this visually. If they were to fight a war, R would expect to have that border drawn at PR and receive everything to the left, and G would expect to receive everything to the right but we need to factor in for costs as well. So remember that war costs are the rebel group some amount CR, and it costs the government some amount CG. And both of these values are greater than zero. So let's start off by factoring in the rebel group's war cost. So if the rebel group fights a war, it expects to receive a value of PR in terms of just the land or the bargaining good. But we need to count that the costs of war are going to subtract from that payoff. So war's cost has a value of CR, which is the distance from PR minus CR to PR. You take PR, you subtract PR minus CR, the value of that is CR. So the distance from PR minus CR to PR represents war's costs. And so although R expects to receive a value of PR in terms of the bargaining good if it were to fight a war, its net payoff is PR minus CR, which is the value from 0 to PR minus CR. So if the parties start a war, if the rebels and the government fight a war, R's net payoff isn't all the way to PR, it's subtracted down to PR minus CR. So what that means is that if we thought about a settlement offer X, remember X is the amount that the rebel group receives, so X as a settlement offer is everything to the left of X is the rebel's amount, and everything to the right is the government's amount. 
If we were to put that settlement offer here, this would be unacceptable to the rebels. The rebels, remember, only get everything to the left of X, and that is going to be a smaller amount than everything to the left of PR minus CR. So if X is to the left of PR minus CR, the rebel group would rather fight a war. What happens if we put it to the right of PR? Well, here, the rebel group is getting everything to the left of X, and that is a lot more than what it would get if it fought a war. If it fought a war, it would only get everything to the left of PR minus CR. So here, clearly, the rebel group prefers fighting or not fighting a war and actually taking that settlement offer X. So we would not expect a war here. What about another option? What about if we put the X there in between PR minus CR and PR? Well, again, although the rebel group is getting less than it was last time, the rebel group is still satisfied with this because that amount, everything to the left of X, is more than everything to the left of PR minus CR. So if we were to have a settlement offer that is to draw the border at X where you see it on your screen there, the rebel group would prefer that settlement offer to fighting a war. So that means everything to the right of PR minus CR is a settlement that R prefers to the war. Everything to the left is something that R does not prefer to war, or, or rather everything to the left is something that R would want to fight a war in response to. Everything to the right of PR minus CR is a settlement offer that the rebel group would rather keep than have a war be fought. We can do the same thing for the government. So now we have a new value on the number line. We have PR plus CG. Now, this might seem strange and counterintuitive at first that we have added the government's cost of war, because remember, costs are supposed to be coming out of your payoff. But by having it being added to this number line, remember that the rebel, or rather the government, is receiving everything to the right of PR plus CG. So that value for the government is 1 minus PR minus CG. Its net payoff is everything to the right of PR plus CG. So you take the endpoint 1 and you subtract it from the beginning point, PR minus or PR plus CG. You distribute that negative and you actually get the value 1 minus PR minus CG, which if you recall back to the last time, that was the government's war payoff. So just to recap that, R, or rather G's expected share if it fights a war is everything to the right of PR, but once you factor out those costs or factor in those costs, then the government's net payoff shrinks to the value of everything to the right of PR plus CG. So what happens if we have a settlement offer to the right of PR plus CG? Well, here... Because the government receives everything to the right of that settlement offer, so every, the, the government receives everything to the right of X, which is that small sliver between X and 1, well, here, the government would rather fight a war because it could increase its payoff to everything to the right of PR plus CG. On the other hand, if we put X to the left of PR, now, again, the government is receiving everything to the right of X, and that is substantially more than what would happen if the government fought a war, in which case it would only receive everything to the right of PR plus CG, which is substantially smaller. And also, if we put it in between, the settlement offer in between PR and PR plus CG, the government is still happy to accept this offer. It's not as happy as it was before when X was way over to the left. But again, everything to the right of X is still greater than everything to the right of PR plus CG. So drawing the border here would also be acceptable to the government. Which means we can conclude that everything to the left of PR plus CG is acceptable to the government, whereas anything to the right of PR plus CG is something that the government would rather fight than accept. So the government is happy with peace on the left and wants war on the right of PR plus CG. Well, remember before, we said that everything to the right of PR minus CR was a settlement that the rebel group preferred. And if we combine that with the fact that everything to the left of PR plus CG is a settlement that the government preferred, you'll notice that there is an amount between PR minus CR and PR plus CG that both sides prefer to war. So if we have this drawn out with the net payoffs and the war costs, we see that this middle range, what we call a bargaining range, exists. What is that? 
Well, it's the set of settlements that are mutually preferable to war. If you put a settlement offer in that bargaining range, the rebel group isn't going to want to fight because fighting would produce a worse average outcome than accepting that offer. And similarly, the government doesn't want to fight because, again, if the government fights, it's going to be getting a worse average outcome than if it just simply accepted that offer. And the costs of war ensure the existence of a bargaining range. Because war is costly, war is going to destroy all these resources, the sides actually can come up with a settlement inside of that bargaining range that both of them prefer to suffering those costs. And also note that the size of the bargaining range is exactly equal to the sum of the costs of war. So the smaller the costs of war, the less inefficient war is, the fewer bargain settlements exist that both sides prefer to war. Whereas if costs are very, very large, then there are going to be more settlements that both sides prefer to war. So what this gets us, or what this buys us, is something called War's Inefficiency Puzzle. This is a research question that asks why actors choose to fight wars when there are more efficient solutions. In particular, there are these settlements within the bargaining range that both of them prefer to war. So we do see wars happening empirically, both interstate and civil wars, as we are interested in this class. So why is it the case that we see civil wars being fought when it would actually behoove both sides, both sides would benefit from a bargain solution. And what we're going to be doing uh, throughout this unit on bargaining is try to explain why actors choose these more costly means, this more inefficient means of fighting, or more in inefficient means of distributing resources, that is war, when they could be taking these peaceful settlements and both being better off. So does this mean that war is irrational? Well, not at all. It just says that war is strange. It's a puzzle. And the puzzle has solutions. It's just a matter of finding the solutions. And we don't have to resort to irrationality. We don't have to pander to the easiest and the lowest common denominator here. There are many good and rational reasons why actors fight wars, why rebels and governments are unable to reach one of these settlements that actually would benefit both of them. And we're going to be exploring those in this unit. So I hope you enjoyed this and I hope to see you next time. Take care.